Hi, I'm Bruce Avenson. I'm from South St. Paul, Minnesota, and I'm a guppy nut. It all started with Henry Huggins and his Gallons of Guppies chapter. So I have a lot of guppies in this fish room of mine, including a hybrid that I'm working on here, where I hope to come up with a blue-tailed, pink-eyed uh, albino guppy, which is called a blue topaz. They're available, but a little bit too expensive for me at this time, so I'm trying to come up with the right breeding combination on my own. So how would you come up with that breeding combination? Well, it's the number this? of crosses uh, going back to the blues, which uh, I maintain a strain of those, the blue-green Moscow's. They're below uh, this particular tank. They're down here. There's a couple of males hiding out in here that show the blue fairly well. Um, there's a female in here, so I'm maintaining a blue-green line which I can cross back in with these hopefully to continue the blue. However, I am finding that the red is a dominant color, so I'm ending up with more red fish at this time than blues, although some of the other coloration is starting to show up. This particular tank carries the snake skin or cobra body pattern on it. So what does that mean, a snake skin or a cobra? What's the difference with, between the two? Well, if we look at a normal uh, gray fish, which would be down here, uh, actually, most of my fish tend to not be grays at all. The grays, do I have a gray to show you? Most of these are gold and other colors. Uh, the grays, yeah, let's, let's take a look at the gray body colored fish down here. This would be a gray body type fish, and gray is the wild coloration. Okay. Okay. Um, but over time, guppies having been kept in captivity for as long as they have, they've they've come up with different sports, and this snakeskin is something that's been around for quite a number of years. So snakeskin's kind of like a, a leathery, like spotted, right type thing that you would see it like maybe an somebody, alligator shoe right. or something. And sometimes snakeskins are known as cobras, so a cobra snake type pattern. Uh, females won't carry it. Um, they'll have some coloration in their fins, but they won't be carrying that snakeskin body coloration on their body. So, so now you talked a little bit ago about female versus male. Like, let's just assume that somebody watching might not know the difference between male and female. Could you help us out? Oh yeah. Let's go over here. On the wall here, we have, this is a non-moving dead type thing, but it'll show what I'm talking about. Uh, the fish on the top here is a female guppy. The fish on the bottom is a male guppy. Now, to, know, to sex guppies properly, you don't want to just look at coloration because you could have a brightly colored female that might look like a male, but indeed is not. Or you might have a really crappy looking male, which indeed is a male, but he doesn't show much coloration. So you really want to pay attention to the fins. On top you have a dorsal fin. On the bottom you have an anal fin. It's directly opposite the dorsal fin, the anal fin. This anal fin is what you really want to pay attention to in sexing guppies because a female guppy has a rounded anal fin, uh, and guppies have internal fertilization. So the pointed anal fin is called a gonopodium, and that's what's used for transmitting the sperm to the female for fertilization, and that's how guppies get pregnant, and mama guppy then will carry those eggs till they become live little babies. That's why guppies are known as live bears, because when they drop their young, they're not dropping eggs, they're dropping fully developed swimming, free swimming fish. So a male guppy has the pointed uh, gonopodium and a female has a rounded one. Now generally females will be less colorful than males, but they're also larger than males. Uh, but if you want to know the difference for sure, you're always going to pay attention to that anal fin. So would That's you say that the, the females would sometimes maybe look like a triangle pointing underneath of it? Yeah, it's triangular or round, but it, when the young are developing, this is a, a dead, dead on sign that you've got males developing. If this anal fin starts to become pointed, it means that your young fish developing are going to become males as opposed to a female. Okay. But as they grow, the females obviously will outgrow the males because that's just the way God made them. Mm -hmm. so. And what else do we have here? Well, we got a couple of nursery tanks in here for the babies. So what would the point of a nursery tank be then? Nursery tank is for <laughs> making sure mama guppy doesn't decide that the babies are delicious to eat because most guppies are highly cannibalistic which means they're going to eat their babies as fast as they're having them if they can track them down. And how big are those tanks? Uh, these little tanks here are two and a half gallons. Okay. 
Uh, my breeder tanks are 10 gallons in size. So how do you get the babies into that tank without the parents? Uh, the babies are generally born in the breeder tanks, and these are four breeder tanks that I have across the top. Uh, I have homemade dividers set up in these tanks to allow the babies to swim through and the parents to be prevented. So my little guys are over here on one side of the divider, and my adults are on the other side of the divider. Now these are not guppies in this particular tank. This is another live bear called a moon or platy. And their wags are called golden wags. But uh, they'll eventually be getting rid of them. I'm pretty much a straight a guppy man. But I do occasionally like to breed some of the other live bears that are out there. So we have a tank here that uh, would, would have albinos from this tank here. These are my red-tailed albinos. And of course I use that to create my hybrids over here and I'm trying to get to a blue tail strain. Um, some of these babies in here do not look to be albinos but looks can be deceiving because uh, oftentimes uh, fish can be in disguise and this is very true for albinism in guppies. They can so be carrying the, the gene. difference between albino and the, the gray and, skin you were talking about earlier? Right. Is, is a difference in body coloration being quite a bit lighter body color because an albino lacks pigment. But the easiest way to tell an albino from a normal fish is by the color of the eye. Mm -hmm. The eye color would be red or pink in an albino, whereas in a, in a fish that's not an albino, it'll be dark. But as I was saying, you can have fish that are carrying the gene for albinism, which means they're going to pass that on to their offspring, but they may not necessarily be showing it. And this is kind of genetic terminology that I'll be throwing at you. There's something called phenotype and genotype. Genotype is what they're carrying on their genes. Phenotype is what they're showing. And with guppies, if you have a fish that has dark eyes, you don't really know, is it carrying the gene for albinism or not? I have quite a few babies in this particular tank that are carrying dark eyes, yet they were born from mamas that were albinos. And so that albinism is going to show up in the next generation. You don't see it here, but doing the proper crosses, you will see it in the next generation. And that's a pretty interesting thing with guppies. And there's other cool and interesting things with guppies. Not only do they have a lot of babies when they have them, but they can have lots of different uh, variations in colors. There can be differences in tail shapes. You can end up with uh, fish that you didn't think you were even expecting. When I did my cross originally with my guppies, I expected my babies to look like gray gray babies and they all did. Those were the F1s when I crossed my albino with my normal eyed fish. But my real shocker was when in the next generation when I did my F1 cross I ended up with a different color strain than what I'd seen before. And I believe they probably called that a blonde. It wasn't an albino and it wasn't a normal dark eyed fish. It was something in between. Um, I do carry a gold strain. Uh, so there's blondes, there's golds, there's grays. There's albinos. There's been a lot of different things that have been done with guppies. Now, I heard you say F1 uh, a couple of times. How do you keep track of the different breedings and, and things like that as, well, a, as you, a hobbyist? <laughs> you need to use your phone or some paper and pencil, and you need to keep track of when they're born, how many you're getting, uh, what, uh, what color variation they have. When guppies are first born, they are not that easy to sex. There are people that claim you can do it under high enough light lighting and you look in their uh, their vent spot and you you can tell but I I've, I've not been able to do it so I don't sex my guppies at a young age I wait so, till So how old would you start sexing them at? Like this would be uh, too small. Some, some of these in here are ready to be sexed out. In fact, uh, some of the red coloration that's showing up on this particular gentleman right here, he's a dead on male because he's already got it in his dorsal fin as well as his tail fin. And in fact, is going to podium is probably starting to show up. He no longer has a round anal fin. He's getting a pointed anal fin. So he will need to come out of there or he could be impregnating the females that are in there and I could have some issues. But my numbers aren't that high right now so I'm really not all that concerned. I'm trying to get my numbers back up and I'll be selecting for the best fish to make the best crosses with. This is a grow out tank. This particular tank houses uh, fish that have been born in my half black blue tank, in my cobra tank, um, 
and also some of the hybrid crosses because I'm already into what's called an F3. My F3s are over here in this barrel. Uh, all these particular F3s are albinos. Um, so what does it mean to be a difference between an F1 and an F3? Okay, these are the generations. Your first cross when you're trying to come up with a new strain is the P cross, the parental cross. And from there you go into your F1, F2. It's simply the number of generations that you removed from the first cross. So the fish in this particular barrel are F3s, which means they're third generation, okay? So we'd need to go back two or no, actually we're going back three generations to F, F2, F1, P. We're going back three generations to get back to the initial cross. So uh, having all these albinos come from this fish uh, tells me that the fish that had these babies were coming from an albino female and an albino male. Otherwise I would have expected to have seen some normalized babies in there, which I don't. Uh, in this particular tank, if you look closely, You'll notice that this particular female has dark eyes. This is what I'm calling a blonde guppy, okay? She was produced from a gold, uh, an albino and a gray strain, okay? She showed up in the F2s, okay? This particular strain. I do not know the genetics, actually. My books really don't give me a lot of detail on, on that particular cross, so I'm kind of having to learn some of this on my own. But I do know that in the F2s that were produced, this blonde showed up in less numbers than the normalide and in less, well, more numbers than the albinos. The albinos showed up in the fewest number. Then came the, these blondes and then the normalide ones. And then would you say there's a difference between the two tanks there for like where the babies can hide and, and why would you choose the, the plant material that you have in both okay. of those tanks? So in this particular tank, we have a lot of guppy grass growing, okay? This provides a lot of good cover for the babies. So if, if the mama drops babies, there's going to be a lot of good cover in there to prevent her from finding so her babies. that's a big ball of and The green there. stuff in yep. there, yes. There's also, I believe, some hornwort hiding out in there as well. Um, we'll see how it does. Some of my tanks get this nasty... Uh, hair algae growing. In fact, that's what's all over my java moss in this particular tank. I'm about ready to toss it. The only reason I haven't tossed it is providing some cover for the cobras. And the cobras tend to be a little more cannibalistic than uh, than some of the other fish. I mean, mo a lot of guppies are cannibalistic. It's probably the exception rather than the norm if you're not cannibalistic when you're a guppy. And this is a tank containing half black blues. So what I'm seeing then from the difference in the tanks here is that I see you've got some tall grassy like um, options for the the babies to hang in. I see there's kind of the middle floater that you've got going on there that can be planted and then I see stuff that just lays on the bottom and then also if you look at the top you've got some of the duckweed well, a wide variety have, of things. Have you found that one or the other is more helpful like if somebody's just getting into um, provide as much cover as you can it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference if you got, if you can get a plant to grow well for you, it's it's go with it. Whatever grows best under your particular lighting conditions and water conditions. For me, certain plants do better than others. Sometimes they don't grow worth a hoot, and you get rid of them. The Valsneria has been a wonderful plant. Uh, I'll be adding it to some of my other tanks. Uh, it comes in a lot of different uh, forms and stuff, but uh, this particular one is the Contortium, Valsneria contortion or um, Asian, Asian uh, bell, I think they call it as well. And we had some Americana at the fish auction today. We did. And, and we that, also had that, some jungle and some, uh, some corkscrew bell, I yeah. even think I heard there. The common names are sometimes a little confusing because it could be the same plant that they're talking about. Somebody wants to call it this and somebody wants to call it that. And then you get into a debate, well, is it the same plant? Well, it probably is, but it would take a scientist or botanist to properly identify the plant for you. And most of us in the hobby aren't that detailed, and we don't know that much about identifying plants. Mm -hmm. So. And then I noticed you have some other fish, you know, hanging around here and there. I saw there's a Corydora that you got over here. And I then do. you got some uh, Plecos that are hanging out. Uh, Placostomus is on the back there. Those are the bristle nose type, right? Albino. Correct. And the, the male's got the points on the nose and the female's more of a rounded nose kind of a thing. 
So yeah. generally speaking, your bristle noses, if they have a head of bristles, they're going to be males. If they're not carrying the bristles, they're going to be females. Is there a reason why you would include fish like that in your baby tanks? And, and oh, absolutely. You want, them, you want them in there for algae control, unless you're one of these people that wants to constantly be taking a scouring pad and cleaning off algae so you can see into your tank. Now, there is a backside to that. Um, as with humans, as with anybody, there's things that... Some people like, some people don't like. And algae eaters might be called algae eaters, but there's many different kinds of algae. So if you get an algae growing, and I don't know if we can make out some of the spotted algae that's growing in this particular tank, yep. but there is some spotted type algae, and this must just taste terrible for the bristle noses because they never eat it. Same so, thing with the black algae that's growing over correct. here in the Sanubia. And that but... could be that could be some beard algae or some hair algae, some other nasty stuff that the uh, bristle nose doesn't want to have anything to do with so you're gonna to have to figure out how to get rid of that on your own if you don't like how it looks mm -hmm. now the thing to remember of course with algae is we may not like it but it's probably doing something wonderful for the water because it takes a lot of crap out of the water that the fish don't really want in the water if they're gonna grow properly okay so so they're not gonna harm your baby guppies at that all one, this is this is uh bristle noses are an excellent choice to be in with guppies because they are not uh predatory they will eat some uh animal matters they're not strictly vegetarians mm -hmm. and people a lot of people don't realize that another nice thing that well something you need to remember is some bristle noses do need to have some wood or fiber in their diet so you'll see chunks of uh, driftwood in some of these tanks to provide some of that now i don't necessarily have it in all my tanks um the bristle noses tend to do a little scavenging so if the guppies let some food fall they're going to be down on the bottom and they'll be consuming some of that so they're good at finishing up what the guppies don't eat and if you're a smart guppy you better get the food while you can now i've noticed two things about your house here with this fish room the first thing that i noticed is uh, almost every one of your tanks, except for your your pond tanks over here, are bare bottom. Is there a reason why when you're breeding, you would want to have bare bottom versus have gravel? Absolutely. Uh, the well-known breeders always have bare bottom tanks. And at one time, I used to have gravel in all my tanks, too, until I realized what they were doing. A bare bottom tank allows you to get into the tank quickly. You'll take a siphon hose and you hook, you get your bucket system set up and I don't have anything fancy or elaborate so I'm just in and I'm opening up a tank and once I've got my bucket down here I'm starting my siphon and I'm pulling all that crap out of there as much as I want to so I'm doing a quick cleanup so it speeds up the process greatly and the other thing that a lot of people don't realize especially newbies in the hobby is that gravel will hide the uneaten food that the fish aren't eating right. and so if your fish have gotten sick and all of a sudden they're not eating and you're not paying attention to your fish and you don't realize they're not eating that food is going to get into the gravel it's going to decompose it's going to fall up your water and your fish are going to have some issues so, so this is where you get like high nitrates and high ammonia yep, spikes yep you'll be able to see that you've got a problem because you'll notice hey there's all this food on the bottom my fish aren't eating it well something's going on here oh i guess you aren't swimming right so it, it draws that to your attention a lot quicker. And another thing, um, I, I feed a lot of live food. I have cultures of microworms. I have a white worm culture. I have vinegar eels. Um, in the summertime, I have water fleas growing outside in my pond system. So my fish don't strictly get the flake food, which I have up here, but they also get a lot of live food. So and, I've, I've heard many hobbyists say a variety of types of food you don't want to just constantly be doing one thing over and over again right have you had bacteria come into your tank because of live food or had parasites or you know fungal problems in your tanks because of the live food would you say that's as a new I, hobbyist that's kind of why i avoid it you know and i'm i don't know enough about it to know uh, i would say that the benefits outnumber the risks um yes you can introduce some stuff like that into your tank no doubt about that but uh, I believe that the fish actually have the ability to fight off a lot of that on their own. Now, if you do get a, a, an illness problem, obviously you're going to need to medicate. And these fish have recovered from a major outbreak of some type, which I had a hard time tracking down. But 
Uh, it certainly wasn't from feeding them live food. It was more a condition of not properly maintaining the tanks. Which... So, so along those lines, so I that was the next thing I was going to say I noticed about your tanks. is So you were gone to the aquarium auction today, and I have not seen a dead fish in any of these tanks yet. I stopped off at a fish store because of a dead fish problem that I had and was trying to recoup some of my fish on the way here. And uh, I didn't even look at four or five of their tanks, and I saw, you know, dead fish everywhere um, within their tanks. So what would you attribute to such healthy fish here at your, your fish room? Uh, well, <laughs> there's a lot of time involved. But if you give fish proper water conditions, they're going to probably thrive for you unless you've got an illness problem. And what I mean by proper water conditions is frequent water changes. But, I mean, a person has to be in there. There's this particular fish here is very skinny and if I had a net in my hand right now it should be coming out of there because whatever its issue is it's probably not going to recover from it and it's probably not worth treating. Uh, most of the fish in this tank are perfectly fine but this particular fish is very skinny bodied and not really swimming in a normal fashion. When you keep fish long enough as I have you start to recognize what normal is to the fish, how it should be swimming, how it should be moving around top and bottom in the tank and when these things aren't working for you, you know there's a problem and you need to be on top of it. And this is another reason why I am such an advocate for a bare bottom tank. So a couple of options would be we can either medicate or we can remove the fish out. We can euthanize it or we could put it into like a, um, a, a tank that's, you know, just for sick fish kind of a thing to Correct. quarantine them out kind of a thing. That could be done. And I would... Uh, whenever you get into a large setup as, as I have here, it doesn't make sense. If I were to have a major outbreak of a disease in this particular tank, I would probably not want to medicate the whole tank unless I have a surplus of money or medication. I mean, it's going to take a lot more medication to medicate a 29-gallon than, say, a 10-gallon or even a 5-gallon pail. I mean, you can make a sick tank, a recuperation tank, uh, a, a tank where you're medicating your fish and it, it just saves you money and saves you a headache and concentrates all your medicine so uh, that's the way I generally go after a disease problem I don't I don't want to medicate a big tank I'll maybe medicate a small tank and if it's just in one tank perhaps I would medicate a 10 gallon but uh, generally speaking I'll try to keep my medication down to a smaller tank because it's much more manageable a lot less time efficient um, sometimes people have other things too going on in the tanks which I don't have but it could be a problem some people like pristine clear water uh, my water all has a yellow tinge to it um, some of that's because of the potted plants in the tank some of it's because the I've feeding heavy and they're not eating all the food and there's maybe some fecal matter so it tends to color the water a little bit yellow. I don't need crystal clear water. I think my water gets as close to that as possible. Some people like to use carbon filtration. It's an additional expense. Yeah, maybe it makes your water look a little clearer. Uh, it's not what I would go with because I'm trying to maintain a hobby that I can afford. So I don't mind some yellow water. Uh, big thing is water changes. I mean, how often would you do water changes? And you said that a couple of times now. And not, how, how much of a water change? Right. And what I've got set up right now in this particular fish room is I'm working out one tank a, a day. Um, I have a thermometer that I bring around. I'm trying to think. Is that... Mm, anyhow, my thermometer tells me what tank I left off on. My tanks are all numbered, so I'm going from 1 to 13, and I'm... I'm getting in there and I'm, I'm cleaning out the filter and I'm doing a partial water change. Never do a, never do a major water change as in more than 50% of the water. This is not good for the fish. Uh, it tends to stress them. The water might even be putrid bad. Maybe it's bad smelling and you got other issues, but the fish get used to it even though it's bad and you create more stress on the fish doing a major water change than you would if you just did the 25%. A water change and that's generally what I'll do in some of these tanks so not only will I be cleaning the filter in one tank but I may be doing water changes in some of the other tanks simply taking some of the water out and replacing them with fresh I have a whole setup over here of containers that are full of water 
We're blessed in South St. Paul, dechlorinated water, so I, I really can use it straight from the tap. The advantage we have here of letting it settle is some of the mineral content will come out. Um, it'll also warm up a little bit so it won't affect the water temperature. Guppies are tropical. This time of the year is winter. Obviously, if you do a major water change and you're putting in that much new water, you're going to drop the water temperature. If you've got healthy fish, they shouldn't mind it. Um, one of the things that the club has pointed out to me on more than one occasion is that in the wild, fish are constantly getting water changes because if they're in a river, the water's flowing past them all the time. They're getting clean water. But in a closed environment like an aquarium, you don't have that going for you. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember, the fish is doing its business in the water. So if you're not taking some of that out, yes, you might have the plants in there which are going to help take out some of that waste products. But if you're not doing a water change, you're really not getting that water back to where the fish need it. And one of the things over in this particular tank, I have a couple of huge male guppies. And I think they're mainly this size because this tank, I've been kind of giving them extra special treatment. So these guys get almost a water change on a daily basis. They're getting like a gallon or two of their water change. And the result is they're producing some males with just simply fantastic tails. Now the females have a little more growing to do. They should be almost a little bit bigger than these males, but they were probably born at two different times, so I don't really know that for sure. All right. Is there anything else that you would uh, pass on to somebody that's maybe considering should getting I get into the, into the hobby. hobby or well, not? Well, here's the thing. This is my recommendation for people getting into the hobby. Don't give up too early. You might kill some fish, but you're going to learn some stuff, and uh, you're going to learn from just making mistakes. So, so it's a good way to do it and talk to other people. Yeah, so I was going to say, so how did you, how do you learn, how do you talk to others, like what's available here in Minnesota that you'd recommend to people? Well, obviously um, we have a club in the Twin Cities called the Minnesota Aquarium Society. Okay. And it's a great place to get to know people and learn a lot. And we're a big enough group where not everybody likes the same kind of fish. So just because this guy likes guppy, maybe this guy likes cichlids, maybe this guy likes angelfish, this guy likes discus. So you get a wide variety of people. And does that club meet often or how do they you... They do. They meet uh, on a monthly basis, the first Thursday of the month. They also have three auctions a year. Um, in 2020, we're doing our second expo where we invite the public to come and see, our, see the fish and learn about the fish. Um, we have had shows in the past, which is competition among the club members. Uh, sometimes it can be a bit deceptive. Um, I'm becoming known as the guppy man. Um, yeah, I heard that a couple of times today. Because yeah. uh, my guppies have placed well at our fish shows. I think the last fish show we did, I think I might have even got... No, it was the second to the last fish show. I got a first, second, and third. So that was a very cool honor that they liked my fish that much. Um, it, you're going to get out what you put in, so if you put a lot of time and effort into your fish and pay attention to them, uh, they can bring you a lot of rewards. And that's where I'd go with it. Alright, well thank you very much for your time and for showing us around your fish room.